So yeah, delighted to be here this afternoon. When I say here, I'm, I'm obviously in my office, but uh, uh, with you, shall we say, um, to talk about rewilding Sussex at this great event, um, all about making uh, natural history, which I thought was a really interesting uh, and kind of fun title. And I think it really applies to rewilding, actually. It's all about bringing back nature uh, in all its different diverse and wild and wonderful forms. And um, I want to talk to you specifically about Rewilding Sussex. Rewilding Sussex is a small community group I set up uh, all the way back in 2014, actually, when I, when I moved to Brighton. Um, I'd come from Denmark uh, for a little bit, and I'd before that I'd been living in the Scottish Highlands. And up there, you can really imagine what rewilding is all about in terms of uh, bringing back big predators like the wolf and the bear and, and in these big expansive areas uh, where we might see nature bouncing back. But I was really interested about what can we do in a more populous, more densely uh, inhabited, more it, it changed landscape like Sussex. And uh, what I really wanted to do is engage young people uh, in, in that question and, and think about uh, what could our our landscapes be and what could we uh, achieve and how can we create something that's essentially fit for the future, I suppose. So yeah, so what I want to talk about is rewilding Sussex and how I think that's going to be beneficial for people and nature. Um, but I want to take you back in time first uh, and I want to ask you a question. Have you ever wondered what the landscape would be like today if people had, hadn't changed it? If they hadn't changed it, if we hadn't turned up and started farming uh, and building our cities and towns uh, and changing the landscape in really dramatic ways, what would this landscape have looked like? What would be here? What might be considered natural, uh, I guess, is, is one way of putting it. Um, and I found this a fascinating question. And the reason I find it fa so fascinating is because I didn't really think about it until much later on in my life, I feel. It was around my late teens and probably early 20s that uh, I'd been for a walk. I'd walked to the top of this hill in Berkshire, uh, near where I lived. I came around the corner as the sun was setting. And you're presented with a pretty glorious view. Uh, but then I suddenly looked at it and kind of realized that this is, a, this is a landscape entirely controlled and managed by people. It's one that's farmed basically as far as the eye can see with just a few pockets of trees uh, and hedgerows kind of uh, defining and creating that field structure. I was thinking to myself all of a sudden, wow, okay, so what, this is an entirely non-natural, entirely human controlled landscape. Um, and I'd never really questioned it before. It would always been the backdrop to my life, uh, but never really thought about why it's like this, uh, what it could be and how it could be different or how it would be if people weren't here. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized this must be true uh, for most people in the UK, not least because 72% of the UK is managed for food production. So we look at this nice map here uh, on the slide, all that bright green and dark brown is agricultural land. It's land we are using to produce food. We're using 72% of the land to produce food. I found that pretty staggering. Uh, and I found it really interesting when I asked my granddad, who's 94, uh, how much land he thought Britain was using for, for agriculture. And he was in the kind of 30s to 40s percent. So it's quite interesting. I think we don't quite realize or we're not challenging uh, our perceptions uh, of the world. We're kind of thinking in general, um, we're not really questioning what our landscape looks like and why it's, why it's like that. Um, so I think it's a pretty fascinating and interesting question. And you can see it on a map like here, uh, like this. Um, but I've also lived in, and worked in a few different uh, landscapes now across the country. And I found whether you live in Glen Livet Estate up in the Scottish Highlands, uh, which has this agricultural matrix uh, landscape, um, whether you live up there or live down here in Sussex, you are generally seeing this agricultural dominated, uh, dominated landscape. And I guess I'm not really surprised if I think about it now that that's the case, but I was quite surprised at the time. Um, and I guess it made me ask that question, uh, what would it be like today uh, if people hadn't changed it? So I'd like to start by taking you through on a short journey uh, through time. Uh, we're gonna do it through using a, a graphic short story. Um, I've been lucky enough to do some research uh, 
uh, in, my, in my career. And we use some beetle data uh, to look into the past to reconstruct uh, what the past might look like. Now, beetle data is fantastic. Um, beetles like really specific hab habitat types. Uh, you get dung beetles that love and depend uh, on dung. So if you have lots of herbivores around producing lots of dung, if you have lots of big animals uh, like uh, our cows and, and, uh, and other animals, you can have lots of dung beetles around, but you have habit, uh, beetles that are associated with all sorts of different habitats uh, from dung to woodland to open areas to, to a mixed and, uh, and diverse landscape. They're like different soil types. Um, so they're really fantastic for telling us really detailed things about what the environment was like when they were living there. And the other nice thing about beetles is they preserve well in the landscape. So when we go back in time by digging down through the earth and getting out soil cores, uh, we can find remnants of those beetles uh, and people with the right skill sets can identify them and then we can associate them with different habitats. So this gives us an opportunity uh, to have uh, a look into the past. I haven't got many of those skills, but I did manage to uh, use a big data set from other people who have collected all these samples across different points in time. So we collected a lot of data. Uh, I put together some, some figures to try and show them in bar graphs and box plots and uh, did some statistical tests. Um, so those are the way I kind of do the science, but what we try to do is tell the story in a, in a slightly more engaging and captivating way. So I worked with my friend uh, Daniel Locke uh, to create uh, these images of the past and take you, to take you through this short story. So what does it look like? Well, I want to first take us back to 125,000 years ago when Britain was a land of giants. Now, 125,000 years ago sounds like a really long time, doesn't it? It sounds like uh, we're going back into kind of a, a really uh, distant past that's probably not, you might think is not as relevant uh, today. Um, well, I kind of challenge that, that, that viewpoint actually, because 125,000 years ago is about the last time the climate was really similar to today. So it's this warm, temperate, what's known as an interglacial period. So it's between these glaciations, these ice ages uh, that some of you might know about. Uh, so the, the climate was very similar to today. And people, modern humans, Homo sapiens, us, had never set foot in the British Isle at this point. So this is the last time the, kind of, the, the landscape might be considered true wilderness uh, in climatic conditions that are quite similar to today. And you might notice uh, a few kind of key things about, um, about this image. Firstly, we had elephants living in Britain. We had rhinos. We had the giant deer known as Megaloceros giganticus, this enormous deer species that had uh, antlers two meters long on each side of its head. It was a landscape full of giants. And it ha we had hippos living in the Thames. We had all these big charismatic mammals that you tend to associate with places like uh, Africa living in Britain. And it turns out this was true uh, across most of the world. So that's one thing to note. The other thing to note is that all the other species that we have here are very similar to the ones we have today. So we have species like wild boar that you might see down here in the bottom right hand corner. But we had oak trees and willow trees. Uh, we had all the kind of plants and animals, the butterflies and the beetles uh, that we have today. So the species we have today, the ones we're trying to preserve and conserve today, evolved uh, and came to be in Britain under conditions where the landscape was shaped by these mega uh, herbivores. And when I say shaped, that's because these large animals are capable of dictating the vegetation structure, the way the landscape looked um, at this time. So because they graze, they kind of eat all the grass, and because they browse, they kind of chew on the, uh, on the leaves and the branches, they're able to stop trees growing in some places, uh, but not in others. So what you get is these mighty, um, and these open grown oaks like you see over here. In other areas where you get less grazing and browsing pressure, you get more closed woodland established. And you create this, what's known as like this mixed mosaic landscape uh, that's really diverse and creates lots of opportunities for all the different wildlife that's trying to th thrive here. So this landscape might be what, you, what might be what you would expect to find today if people hadn't turned up. The reason I say that is this. If we jump forward to 40,000 years ago, 
we're in a quite a momentous moment. This is the time where modern humans, Homo sapiens, our ancestors going way, way back, uh, that first arrived in the UK. So uh, humans had walked out of Africa, they had turned right and, and colonized Asia all the way down into Australia, and they had turned left and come up into Europe, and they made it to Britain at around 40,000 years ago. Now at this time, we're in a, what's known as a glacial period, one of these ice ages. Now, we, there was lots more ice in the world, but the southern England wasn't. Uh, we still had variable seasons, uh, but the climate was no longer suitable for lots of trees to grow. Uh, but we had this wonderful, open, uh, more tundra-like landscape. But and where we had had straight tusked elephants and uh, narrow-nosed rhinoceroses, uh, we suddenly had woolly uh, rhinos and woolly uh, mammoths living in the landscape. We also had hyenas and lions that were also in the previous landscape as well. But this was the last time the landscape was really dominated by megafauna. After humans turned up, as we moved into and climates changed, all these species started going extinct in what's known as the megafauna mass extinction. They all started dying out, unfortunately, and we lost um, over 177 species weighing more than 10 kilograms across the world. And this changed the way nature worked. So if we come in forward again to 7,000 years ago, we're back into this warmer climate, this interglacial period. We had humans now living in here this, as hunter-gatherers, this new effective predator coming with new hunting techniques, new technology. They could throw spears, creating a whole new uh, set of risks for large, predator, large herbivores that they might not be expecting. We now don't have the biggest animals. We don't have the elephants and the rhinos and the elephants, but we still have aurochs and wolf and lynx. Uh, and they are still grazing and browsing and hunting within this landscape. They're still creating a bit of a mixed mosaic, but this loss of the biggest animals has allowed more trees to grow. So all those animals in the past uh, that were thriving in the open areas were suddenly less prevalent and less present uh, in these landscapes, they were less abundant. And where all the species that really liked woodland conditions uh, were doing better. We hadn't suffered great extinctions uh, beyond the megafauna at this point. We, we lost a few specialists, uh, but we just changed the nature of the landscape. This, the, so the landscape's dynamic and changing. If we jump forward again to two and a half thousand years ago, humans in Britain have now developed agriculture. So we have now have low intensity agriculture. Uh, various livestock species like sheep and cows have been brought into the landscape. Uh, and some of the woodland is being cleared. It's still low intensity, so there's still plenty of woods and trees around. Um, and what's actually really interesting here is that the beetle data suggests that the structure of the landscape, the amount of open area and closed area in this period where humans are clearing some of the trees and supporting large numbers uh, of big uh, herbivores in, in the form of livestock is actually more similar to the last interglacial than the early Holocene, that previous landscape was. So this might reflect uh, and give the same opportunities in terms of the habitat types uh, as the last interglacial did. So again, we didn't lose too many species at this point, uh, but we've changed the community composition. Different species are thriving depending on how much habitat uh, that suits them is available. So yeah, so this is a kind of an example, perhaps, uh, of people uh, filling that role of the mega, mega herbivores. If we jump forward again to the present, um, what we're seeing is intensive agriculture now dominating our landscape. So in Sussex, we have 71% uh, of the land is used for agriculture. Uh, nature is now increasingly being pushed to these small nature reserves in a few areas and um, being pushed to the fringes of, of the fields. Uh, this is being done better by some farmers and, and other land users and, and not so well by, by others. But what it means is uh, what the, the big change here was this kind of reduced space for nature, this new kind of intensive use of the land is now causing a, a, a mass extinction. Uh, for so many different species. And it's one of the reasons why uh, the UK is ranked 189th as the most ecologically, 189th most ecologically degraded countries uh, in the world. So we're in a very poor, poor state environmentally. Our most protected areas, what's known as um, sites of special scientific interest, 
of which 61% are not are considered to not be in a good condition. So most of our areas, most of our protected areas are not in a good ecological condition. And this is because they are small uh, and they need management, they need constant care and attention because nature's not functioning uh, as it once had. And even more drastically, 0% of our rivers uh, are in a good ecological or chemical condition. Environmentally speaking, this last change, this switch into intensive agriculture uh, and other land uses and other practices that are causing uh, pollutants, this kind of persecution of wildlife uh, is causing this kind of degradation of the system overall and is not leaving us in a good place. So while there is lots of good reasons for, for change and producing food is really important and I'm a big food lover uh, myself and we absolutely need that, we need to ask ourselves, is food the only thing we need? What do we want in the future uh, that's going to meet our needs? We know we're facing um, a climatic uh, emergency. We know we're facing an extinction emergency. Uh, we know we need lots of things for our landscape, such as food, but also we need to sequester and store carbon. We need to be able to manage flooding. Uh, we need places where people can go out and get that quality of life of experience. I read today in The Guardian that a study suggests that half uh, of psychiatrists dealing with young people uh, are, are seeing people who are suffering from environmental anxiety. We are really worried about the future and we ought to be worried about the future because there are a lot of challenges that we face. And I want to know and we'll think about is going into the future, can we create landscapes that are fit for that future? They're gonna meet those needs. They're gonna create the hope that we need that we can solve the problem. I want to ask, what the next chapter looks like. How do we move from uh, this kind of intensive uh, land use condition? How do we get rid of the worst parts of this landscape and promote the best parts so we, uh, so we can uh, live uh, in a landscape that's good for both people and nature? For me, this is where I think rewilding can come and play a part. Rewilding is all about giving nature the chance to leave, or as my PhD student put it, it's time for nature to drive in some places some of the time, because I think it would just be a fantastic educational uh, and uh, kind of research experience just to see what nature does and how it can benefit us. I think we would find it does things unexpectedly, and I think we would benefit from the experience. Um, I want to tell you what young people think about rewilding because I think they can say, say it so much better uh, than I can. So here is a short video we put together uh, where we asked lots of young and passionate conservationists about what they think uh, about rewilding. So let me, let me let them tell you. Rewilding to me is hopeful. It's exciting, it's encouraging. A message of positivity and conservation. Really recognising nature as an ally uh, and working alongside it to improve uh, our environment. Rewilding is really just a, a look to the future. It's a chance to do something different in nature conservation, engage new people in it and, uh, and really just shake it up a bit. This instead is something proactive and optimistic. Just letting Mother Nature do its thing. So three words to summarise rewilding would be hopeful, wild of course, optimistic, connection, exciting, optimism. You've caught me with this question, I'm going to have to go again. Hopeful, energising, holistic, challenging, adventure. I don't know, <laughs> let me think. <laughs> Wellbeing, fresh, enchanting, engaging, and worth doing. So I think those young people do an amazing job at, at, at highlighting the excitement and enthusiasm and, and the hope that working with nature uh, brings uh, to the next generation. I think that kind of idea uh, that we can work with nature to kind of get that joint recovery and healing um, for the land, for nature, for people uh, is, so, uh, is so important. And I think it needs to play a part in the future of our landscape. Now we're lucky in Sussex that uh, we have one of the uh, most well-known rewilding projects uh, in the country. It's called the Nep Estate and it was started uh, um, by the owners uh, Charlie Burrell and Isabella Tree uh, back in <clears throat> so about uh, 20 years ago 
Um, when it was an arable farm that they were trying to farm uh, effectively uh, and maximizing the, the, the products they were producing. It was an arable and dairy farm uh, and their fields looked like this. And what they did was they kind of stopped, uh, stopped farming it. They stepped back and allowed nature uh, to bounce back. And the transformation has been pretty incredible. Lots of diverse uh, plants and, and uh, animals are coming back into the landscape uh, and creating the, all these unexpected findings. So things like purple emperor butterflies are getting established again. We're seeing turtle doves uh, doing really well in the landscape, nightingales uh, doing well. There's all these animals that are just coming back and responding to nature uh, and making its change. Uh, animals are important in the landscape as well. So in this southern block, which is where this image was taken, um, they had about uh, six years uh, by which nature uh, was allowed to bounce back after, um, after the, the, they stopped farming. Uh, they then put a fence around the area which allowed them to bring species in like uh, longhorn cattle and tamar pigs and uh, various deer species. They kind of brought these grazers and browsers into the landscape um, after a few shrubs and plants had managed to get established in those arable fields. And they added to that mix um, of this kind of dynamic landscape by grazing some areas and browsing some areas. They've really helped to create this mixed mosaic of habitats so that you have some areas that are open and grassy, which suits those species that like uh, to have the sun on their backs. Uh, whereas you've also got these kind of shrubby areas um, that are uh, uh, provide a lot of shelter uh, and protection and different food sources. And this mix is what supports what's known as biodiversity, the diversity of life. So it's this fascinating combination where plants and vegetation is growing up from the bottom and they're interacting with the animals that are grazing and browsing and hunting uh, down from the top. And it's that mix that brings that dynamic uh, and, and, and a dynamic state of nature that is so special. So it's really important we start thinking uh, not only about the plants that we might uh, want to see in the, in the landscape or the trees that we might want to see back, we also want to think about the animals that we can see within our landscapes again. And some of these are really, really important in the way they work. So the wild boar, an animal I studied during my PhD, um, has this fantastic behavior called rooting. So it sticks its nose into the ground and it turns over the vegetation looking for grubs uh, and bees and bees nests and roots uh, and rhizomes of bracken. In fact, wild boar eat a, a huge diversity of things. I think one study found 400 different species within, it, within its diet. It turns it over and it creates these big patches of bare ground. Now, some people call this damage and say this damages nature, but that's not how nature works. Nature needs disturbance. It's evolved to adapt to animals like wild boar coming in and creating a bit of disturbance, kind of stopping one species becoming dominant and creating a fresh uh, patch for new pioneering species to get established. And again, it's creating those diversity of conditions that's so important for nature. So wild boar Okay, you might not want it in your, in your back uh, garden um, all the time, or you might want, want it on your football pitch, uh, but in nature, it's not the same. It needs that level of disturbance. It needs that kind of dynamic change. Beavers are the poster child for, for rewilding, this fantastic engineering species uh, that comes in and builds dams, uh, changes watercourses, creating wetland, uh, and which is fantastically important for all those dragonflies and other uh, species that are really dependent on that wetland environment that's been massively reduced through, through drainage uh, as we've intensified agriculture. Not only that, does it, it also helps um, kind of attenuate uh, flooding. It can mitigate flooding and help us reduce that. Uh, it's not, obviously it's flooding some ground up, um, upstream, uh, but it's helping reduce flooding downstream. Um, it's, uh, it's purifying the water of the process as well. So they kind of fantastic benefits for people and nature. You can get some of these really large herbivores like uh, European elk, um, which could be really important as nature gets a chance to establish a bit more. We need to think about predators like the what's known as the Scottish wild cat or the Highland tiger, um, which actually has a very broad range across, across the world, but is now restricted just to the Scottish Highlands where there's hardly any left. Um, we want to bring back predators to kind of change those dynamics of a prey species uh, at a smaller level here. So large animals play really important roles in ecosystem, and we need to think about that and see how that fits in. 
So that's kind of what rewilding is, is kind of giving nature space to do its thing. Uh, it's bringing animals back that play important roles. And I think that can be really important in helping us uh, create landscapes uh, that are good for people and nature. Now, one of the things that I really take home when I think about that is I know people need lots of diverse and different things. Uh, and people want uh, different things in themselves. We're not all the same. We're, we're, we're a nice diverse collection of people that prioritize different things. And I think that's where we need diversity within our system. So I know we want education. I know we want beautiful landscapes that we can connect with. We need uh, beauty and uh, good lifestyles. We need health um, uh, in, in ourselves. Uh, we need healthy soils, we need biodiversity, we need places for nature, we need a functioning ecosystem that can help look after itself and us. Uh, we also need food and energy and uh, other products. Um, and it's not that we're saying we should get rid of anything in particular, it's just saying we need that diversity uh, if we're going to go forward and, and meet those needs. So we're proposing rewilding as an important part of the solution, but we don't think it would think is the only way forward. In fact, we think diversity creates diversity. We need that diversity of the way people interact with the landscape. Um, and rewilding is one of those ways, but there are many others. So some of the research I've done uh, locally is looking at how we manage land in different ways. And in this case, uh, we were looking at six kind of really interesting sites that use either um, uh, uh, um, Oh, sorry, I'm lost my train. Uh, ecological agriculture. So I completely um, lost my train on, on, on the name there, but also um, conservation as well. Uh, and there's some really fantastic sites out there, uh, such as Tablehurst Farm, which uses something they call biodynamic farming, which has got some really interesting cultural uh, and ecological practices, which again is all about working with nature. Um, the Saddlescombe Farm uh, with Camilla and Rowley as the local farmers there, but working farming in a very conservation friendly uh, place. We have the Wildlife Trust working in a place called Butcherlands, which is part of the Ebono Common uh, Nature Reserve, uh, where they've kind of allowed nature uh, to, to recover after farming uh, in a very similar way to NEP that I was telling you about just now. We have Ashdown Forest, which is this very historical landscape that's had uh, kind of a human presence and a nature presence for a really long time. We've also got areas like uh, the Brighton and Hove City Parks that are also providing important things uh, for nature. If we look at all these different landscapes, one of the things we find is that they have different communities of large herbivores on and they are managed differently uh, by, uh, by people in those spaces. So in areas like Tablehurst Farm and Saddlescombe Farm, uh, they got, tend to have quite high densities uh, of large herbivores because of the farming uh, side of it. In places like Nep and Butcherlands, uh, you get lower densities of those animals uh, and they tend to be ma the landscape managed in a, in, a, in, a, in a less intense way. At Ashdown Forest you've got this kind of interesting uh, mix of human and natural processes working, uh, supporting a, a, a rare and unusual uh, habitat in this lowland heath. And then in the council area you've kind of got so many uh, different requirements with lots of people using that landscape, uh, lots of different needs. And all of this combines to create this diverse landscape where in Tablehurst and Saddlescombe, you get these kind of uh, open, you know, the field structure, there's open vegetation uh, where you can have support lots of different biodiversity, but the, uh, you get the uh, hedgerows as well. And then places like Nep and Butcherland, you've got much more shrubs getting established, these uh, thorny and protective uh, shrubs that allow trees to grow up uh, in amongst them. Um, you get this diversity. At Ashdown, as I said before, you get this rare habitat type. And then for council, you just get this interesting mix of people and nature together. And what's fascinating about this is it's this collection uh, of landscapes uh, that creates that the diversity of things for people and nature. Just from a biodiversity point of view, um, we recorded uh, what species were doing well in different, in different areas under different groups. Um, and one of the things that was really noticeable from this rewilding point of view is that uh, Nep and Butcherlands uh, were particularly good for supporting a high species richness of birds and really high abundance uh, as well. So they were doing really well in, in that area. Um, but that's not to say other sites weren't doing as well as well, uh, really well as well. So Tablehurst, which had the highest levels of meat production, 
Uh, so there's kind of more intensive agriculture than, than anywhere else. It was also really good for invertebrate species richness uh, and abundance as well. Uh, and it was really noticeable that all of these areas did well in different places. So Ashdown Forest was really good for rare species. Tablehurst combined uh, very high food production, but also did well across biodiversity metrics. Nep and Butcherlands uh, were really good for, for, uh, for the conservation metrics in, in, in a number of areas. Uh, Saddlescombe has some similarities to Tablehurst and Council just had so many people using it in a real variety of habitat structures as well. So it's by combining all of these different habitats that we create diversity. So this idea of diversity creating diversity, it's that mixture of people and, and, and land coming, uh, people and nature coming together uh, for a better future. So what do I think the, the what do you we think the next chapter should look like? Well, I want to share with you some visions um, that we've got young people to create. So these were primarily teenagers, some of them quite younger teenagers, uh, to create a vision of the future that they would like to see and bring them hope. And their their visions are really fantastic. Um, they brought together so many diverse things in, in different ways. They had landscapes with many more trees in and still had a place for, for people, uh, but also new forms of technology to provide um, energy, uh, as well as different habitat types. We had some wilder scenes uh, that brought uh, beavers in uh, and create some really vis beautiful visions uh, for the future. Uh, again, we like there's more more diversity. We've got some more wild flowers, please. We've got beavers again. We've got uh, locally produced food, and we've got sustainable energy in, in different forms. Uh, we've got different habitats featuring again, and these are all uh, young people's own creations. We've got people thinking about we need corridors to connect up our, our nature and biological corridors that are so important uh, to allow nature to move through the landscape and colonize new areas and allow it to be dynamic and, and changing. We brought so much color uh, and vibrancy, um, and again, you know, more wetlands and, and diversities. We, we saw some really magical visions of a, of a, of a future uh, that might have uh, included elephants and volcanoes, where I think someone's really get embracing that very long-term future uh, that might be stretching forward millions of years. We got people embracing that kind of Pleistocene uh, vision of what could be here today and can ask the question about whether uh, elephants and lions, will, where, where will they be in the future if we give them space to expand? But I found from this, it kind of actually reflects that research uh, so nicely, uh, where we've got this kind of diversity of future with more nature and people living in a way that's, that's, um, that's uh, diverse and sustainable. And we're trying to combine that vision for the future so that we have people and nature uh, working together. Uh, and that means you know, space for people, space for wilder animals, um, such as beavers and large herbivores, and maybe some predators into the future as well, with these mixed habitat types, creating this kind of diversity of vision. Uh, and I'm really excited by that. And my feeling is we need more young people actively involved in the management of our, of our land into the future, because they'll be the ones that are going to be inheriting uh, this, these landscapes. They're, they're going to be the ones that are facing some of the biggest challenges uh, going into the future. And I actually think they have some really great ideas that we should embrace and support. So from a rewilding Sussex perspective, uh, we would like to find um, a space uh, to let young people be a driving force in implementing rewilding. What better way to learn about how the nat nature and the landscape and people work uh, by having a patch that young people can input directly into so they can be part of the decision making. I think it'd be such a fantastic learning opportunity for them uh, and for everybody else as well. We'd love to get involved in training young people up uh, and helping them get jobs in rewilding because what better way of connecting with nature is there uh, than, um, than working out in the landscape. I think that'd be brilliant uh, in, in many ways uh, for them and for everybody else as well. Uh, we want to get young people in, involved in reintroducing species back into Sussex that will benefit people in nature. Uh, we want to look at a whole diversity of, of what might be possible uh, with that regard. And I think there's just some great opportunities uh, for us to do that. Some people say there might not be enough space to do this in a busy place like Sussex. Um, but a, a colleague, Tom Dando, recently shared this map with me, um, which was of Sussex. And he's highlighted that there's 8,000 hectares of sport and leisure and urban green space 
uh, in Sussex. Most of that is golf courses uh, scattered around the country. And this is five times the area of big rewilding projects in the county. So I just wonder if we gave that space, it gave the kind of equivalent area uh, to nature in Sussex, you know, what wonders can nature paint for us um, if we did that? So just to uh, wrap this up then, I'm gonna play one last video for you. Uh, and this is a, we asked these young people uh, what their, uh, what a vision for a wilder countryside uh, might look. And I, I, I think they paint a really wonderful picture. Uh, my dream vision for a wilder countryside would be a rewilding accepted and embraced at a local level, national level, um, and seeing national parks, gardens, city parks uh, commit to making space for, re for rewilding. The opportunity to see vast areas of land uh, being able to heal itself. A space that is safe for wildlife um, to just do its thing and for people to enjoy. So for me, a wilder landscape, it would look messy. It wouldn't look tidy as we like to manage it. It would be messy, dynamic, constantly moving, constantly changing. A wilder countryside to me looks diverse, where you can go outside and see a patchwork of different habitats, different animals and plants. My dream vision for a wilder countryside actually involves people, because I think it's really important that people connect with nature and they spend time outdoors and learn to, to really love and appreciate it. I think the animal that I'd most like to see return to Britain in the future um, would probably be the great wolf. I think I would like to see the beaver reintroduced to Britain. The lynx because they're absolutely beautiful creatures. The penistrel bat because I don't think there's enough of them in the wild currently and I'd love to see more of them. I would most like to see the wolf return to Britain. I would most like to see the Dalmatian pelican return to Britain. I would love to see beavers return across the UK. I'd love to see more beavers return to Britain. The animal I'd most like to see return to Britain is the red-billed chuff. Okay, so that was it from me. Um, I'd just like to say thanks to all the people that have put all that information together and kind of shared their visions of the future. Um, because I think they're fantastic and it is great to be able to work with them. Uh, and thank you very much for listening. And I, I see there's some questions coming in that I, I might be able to uh, address uh, as well. Um, <clears throat> it looks like they're coming up by text. Um, so I think I might just want to um, uh, read some of these uh, questions out and do my best to answer them. Um, I think that's right, Rob. I, I guess we can't do any um, direct exchange. So um, let me know if I need to do something different, but <clears throat> we have the first question up. So my memory of NEP is that the boar had eaten all the bluebells and the only flower was fleabane. Will we find a rewilded countryside beautiful? Um, that's a great question. Um, so it depends what you find beautiful. Uh, I have definitely been to NEP with a lot of young people who find NEP uh, this kind of fantastically wild experience that they kind of equate uh, with going on safari and other types of en environment and, and come back really positively about it. Um, there's a lot of flea bane there at the moment. I suspect that will change. So if you're like one of the young people talking about like that kind of dynamic and, and uh, different landscape will appreciate it. Um, it's interesting and you kind of highlight that they ate all the bluebells, which you saw positively when bluebells dominate the landscape, but uh, see flea bane as negative if flea bane's dominated the landscape. Landscape. So I really think this comes down to uh, what individuals appreciate. And I've certainly been at NEP with people getting very upset about what they are are seeing there and I think other people really appreciate it. So while I'm not suggesting we do rewilding everywhere, I think uh, if you do it in some places and do it differently in different places, you'll get uh, some people appreciating it and some not so much. But again, it's that diversity bringing the spice of life um, that's going to work for a lot of people. Um, do, do, do. So unexpected, I, th I think the unex most unexpected thing was how well, uh, sorry, what, has there been any un unexpected findings from the rewilding project at NEP? Uh, so I think one of the most unexpected things was how well the Purple Emperor Butterfly uh, had done. Um, so it's one of those environments that was more associated with uh, more wooded landscapes, but it seems to be doing really well in this uh, nature environment that's kind of bouncing back. Um, the other thing I think that's interesting about NEP is it's actually divided up into three separate blocks. 
and it being uh, variable in that in that space um, we're getting different outcomes coming from different places so depending on how many herbivores you have there you kind of have these different different things going on um, and it's really interesting that in some areas they've kind of put these fenced areas up where there's no herbivores are able to get to come in so you can kind of compare what's happened in different uh, in different areas uh, and under those circumstances you might expect trees to always grow but but they didn't and you get different things happening in different places so I think it highlights the kind of how chaotic uh, nature can be uh, and potentially how that is needed uh, within the landscape we might need uh, some dynamics uh, uh, to work as well how would I know how would you know what the right balance is for letting nature do its thing and intervening to make it better for specific species uh, and some points about the uh, pearl bordered fertility. So I think this issue is an interesting one. So my, uh, my worry with conservation is we tend to focus our efforts on preserving the species that we feel is important. Uh, and we probably give less species that, that don't have the same charisma that we might, uh, we might find. So while I have absolutely no problem with managing for specific species in some places, uh, some of the time, I think it, that process can um, unconsciously result in some species not getting that same attention. And what I like about rewilding is it doesn't allow us to bias, it, it reduces the amount of human bias there is in, in that and might benefit uh, some species compared to others. So I think it is a nice, a, a nice mix here where if we're not giving all that space to nature, we don't get all that natural variety, we might well need to manage uh, for some species some of the time, but I also think we need that uh, unexpected uh, benefits to things like nightingales and, uh, and, and uh, purple emperor butters in, in a less managed um, situation. Uh, absent rabbits, what browsers are comfortable around humans uh, and dogs? Uh, how do they use um, animal that sterilize animal dung around here? So some of the details there, I'm probably not totally familiar with uh, Tablehurst uh, to deal with all, all the specifics there. Um, what browsers are comfortable around humans and dogs? Uh, I think that comes down to actual uh, familiarity uh, with people and also I think it would be an issue of um, which animals, which humans and dogs are around, uh, are comfortable around different browsers. So uh, wild boar seem to be fairly comfortable around most but not everyone's comfortable uh, around them. Uh, I've seen some interesting uh, interactions between uh, European elk and, and wild boar. Um, so learning to live with each other is, is an interesting one. Uh, a lot of species are, are, are probably more comfortable with humans than, uh, than others. Something like the wolf, which is obviously not a herbivore, uh, but this amazingly adaptable species that can live in almost uh, any environment where there's enough um, prey uh, can, probably do can probably live with people if people can live with them, which is, is the latter that tends to be the problem. Uh, big animals equal big fences. Is that part of your vision? Um, uh, I don't quite follow the second half of the question, but in terms of the first half, um, I think bit fences can play a role um, in some of those areas. We live in a very fenced uh, environment uh, in general, whether you kind of see hedgerows as fences or, or big fences uh, in that as well. Um, and that's partly because uh, our roads can be an issue, so I can see uh, fences being a, a useful part of it, uh, and they are well used in many landscapes. So I don't see why they they shouldn't they should be automatically avoided uh, from the perspective of uh, rewilding. Uh, but you can do rewilding in different places, different ways um, to suit different contexts. So you you can do a more passive approach and just let uh, the vegetation grow where you don't need uh, fences in, the, in those in those areas. Young people, I guess you include qualified young specialists who follow a theme or wealth, what about methodology? Uh, I'm not following the second half of that question. Um, the young people in here, it wasn't part so much of a study, it was more of an exploration of uh, young people engaged in, ca in catching those, those views. Um, <clears throat> future or where there's reintroduce of predators like lynx and heavily settled landscape. Yeah, so I, I I'm probably of the opinion that uh, lynx in Sussex is, is probably going to be difficult, uh, not least because um, uh, I don't think it'd be great for, for the lynx and the road density would be a particular, particular challenge. I'm told something like, um, 
but it's not really a big predator. In terms of other predators, again, for Sussex, I, I'm not having wolf high on my uh, on my reintroduction list for down here, just simply because of, of the challenge. And I think there are better places for, for that to happen. Not that I'd rule it out. Uh, I'm a big believer in we need to learn, everyone needs to learn how to do, deal with these animals as, as much as possible. Um, I find most, most reasons for not having it in our, our own backyard, um, if applied globally, would probably be well, evolve in the eradication of, of a lot of species, I'd be very depressed um, to see go extinct. So obviously we have troubles living with badgers and foxes, and I know plenty of people living with um, wolves and, and, and lions that, that, that present that, that challenge. So um, there's a, I think there's all sorts of issues in there, but I, I think we need to try and explore to see what's possible. And things like the wolf has a, a, an amazing ability to live alongside people if people allow it. Um, change in the way the landscape looks, especially more intensive farming. Uh, so I talks like this, how can you communicate with those uh, changes to the wider public? So in terms of change to the landscape, I think this comes back again to different people wanting different things. Uh, and, and that might change as, as we go uh, forward and, and, and look at different challenges. Um, so as I say, I've definitely been and, and seen and heard from people um, really aggressively um, um, uh, you know, finding like the NEP landscape offensive and other people absolutely loving it. Um, so I think there's always going to be differences in our opinion. And what I really hope is that we can find um, space for, for more. So I think we need to be looking at saying, you know, what, what balance do we have at the moment? And I think 70% agriculture might not be the most efficient use of, of space. Uh, we can look at reducing food waste and we can try and create space for other forms of land use uh, and I think in doing so we support more people in, in, in different ways. Um, oh last one okay beaver interest in happening it looks like being successful in the absence of large predators will people accept beaver control when the impact becomes too great? Um, this is a, a, a big debate obviously um, and, and people again have very different views on it and I don't think we'll necessarily be able to to change it. Um, I, I take quite a pragmatic view and, and say for exactly that reason, if you can't, if you can't reintroduce uh, at the full dynamics of nature, then you might want to look at um, what controls you might need to take. And obviously there are uh, issues around what type of control, whether it's lethal or um, kind of altering reproductive success, which has its own impacts. Uh, or moving animals uh, to other areas uh, would be nice. Um, Nature is a pretty brutal uh, place in, in many cases. I'm, I'm, I'm fairly comfortable with that uh, in, in, in some respects. Um, and, I, and I think there's, you know, there's, there's difficulties in, in all of those decisions uh, and you have to look at it on a, on a case by case basis. Uh, but I can, everything I've seen suggests there are some people that just will not accept um, certain things because it, it, it uh, doesn't fit their value structure and they feel like it's morally wrong and I, I, I totally respect that, that opinion uh, and there are other people that will have a completely the opposite opinion and I think they also have uh, lots of good points. So ultimately um, you're kind of looking to see what the, the populace will, will decide in terms of kind of a democratic process I, I guess uh, and hoping to uh, engage people whether it's events like this um, I know the city, uh, Brighton City Downlands um, is, is going through change. Uh, I do various interdisciplinary types of research looking uh, at, at both um, trying to engage people and nature and seeing how we work together uh, as best I can. But it, it's not an easy one. And yeah, it's a, it's a diverse world out there. And I guess uh, people will make decisions as they will. Um, that will I, I hope um, that the idea of more nature, nature recovering, um, I think there's quite a lot of support for that vision uh, out there. So I hope we can find some places um, uh, that, that, we can, that can achieve that, engaging people that are enthusiastic uh, as, as well, uh, and as well as trying to minimize uh, the negatives for anyone who doesn't want to see that vision uh, come, come to the fore.